what's good y'all we're ross back at again with another video so i'm gonna check out wrestling matches where the wrong guy won now this should be a very interesting one been looking forward to checking this one out um it's just other things have uh, been happening and coming up but um i think we've all seen this probably maybe too many times especially under the vince, uh, vince mcmahon era of creative booking where we know someone should win this match or win the feud and for whatever reason whether it's vince wanting to stick it to the fans and do what he wants to do which i do think that was a lot of the the situations where he felt like he knew what was best and wouldn't listen to the fans um it'll be a situation where a wrestler is set up to win makes sense for them to win could definitely get them even more over only for them to lose and the perfect person i can think of instantly is oscar when she had that undefeated streak coming from nxt and she's packing up everybody not taking no losses she ends up going to face charlotte at that year's wrestlemania only for her to lose to this day it was something that us fans just it just doesn't make sense I, uh, Charlotte could have definitely taken that loss um, Especially When it came to You know really building up Asuka As this really new big threat In the women's division so That's one I can easily think off the top of my head I'm sure y'all can think of some others They probably may be on this video Hopefully they are Let's get right into them Go down a uh, painful memory lane Step up Cause you're the next one and I'm gonna kill you Don't believe it, but the betting that you will Sometimes in pro wrestling, decisions are made that leave you scratching your head Particularly yeah. when it comes to who wins and who takes a loss in a perfect world, wins and losses are laid out for specific reasons and there's already a roadmap in place that ends with both fan satisfaction and big money. But mm -hmm. this doesn't always happen. Some match outcomes throughout pro wrestling history have been detrimental to both the company and the person taking the loss. Yeah. Fans have shown so much displeasure about certain matches that still to this day you'll hear people say that should have never happened or the wrong guy won. So let's take a look at some of these <laughs> matches in today's video and let's check out some of the biggest examples of the wrong guy going over. As always, you may not agree with some of these and that's fine. Don't come at me if your favorite superstar is included in this video. This was put together while researching the topic online and seeing what matches got brought up the most. But do use the comment section to share your opinions. Should be a good one, man. First, it's an obvious one. Triple H beating Booker T at WrestleMania 19 is seen as a big misstep from... Oh, man. Do we even have to say anything about this one? And I love Triple H. I love what Triple H is doing with WWE. It's fucking fantastic. But he knows, and everyone else knows, this was a just a colossal misstep, mistake. Huge mistake. WWE not only because Booker lost all his momentum after getting pinned, but because the storyline going into the match made it feel like Booker was actually gonna win. Triple H made comments about people like Booker not being deserving of the world championship, implying that the color of Booker's skin was reason enough for him not to deserve any professional success. You thought. When watching the promos back, you can also take this as Triple H may be implying that Booker's history with the law and his rough upbringing were actually reasons why Booker didn't deserve the gold in comparison to the clean cut suit wearing Triple H. But then Hunter talked about Booker's, and again I quote, nappy hair and how Booker T generally presented himself. It made Triple H look bad, not gonna lie about it. Yeah. With the words Triple H said, fan support for Booker T was really, really high. And even forgetting about all this, I personally think Booker really did deserve to win the World Heavyweight title at WrestleMania, just because he was always an excellent top tier performer. But Triple H pretty much destroyed Booker at WrestleMania 19, and still to this day, fans bring it up as a case of the wrong guy going over. It's Awful. hard to argue, really. Triple H was a made man, and dropping the belt at Booker wouldn't have hurt Hunter in the least. It would have done wonders for Booker T in 2003, but Booker took a loss right here, and the storyline was pretty much over after this WrestleMania match. Hunter would move into a rivalry with Kevin Nash shortly afterwards. Missed opportunity. That's all I'm gonna say. Missed opportunity. 
I know the vast majority of fans wouldn't care if Brock was never seen on television again after recent developments, <laughs> but way back in 2012 when he made his WWE return, he was showcased as a new, more dominant monster thanks mm -hmm. to his time in UFC. John Cena, meanwhile, was going through what he called the worst year of his career. The Rock had defeated mm -hmm. Cena at WrestleMania 28, and John now had to fight an unstoppable beast at the very next pay per view. And the majority of that Cena vs. Brock match that took place at Extreme Rules 2012 was pretty much nothing but Brock Lesnar destroying Cena from bell yep. to bell. Lesnar was more violent than ever before, busting Cena wide open at the start of the match mm -hmm. and showing off this new style that made him someone to be legitimately afraid of. He bullied Cena to the point where it felt like the match would have to be stopped, but bizarrely, Cena ended up winning after delivering an attitude adjustment <laughs> on the steel ring steps. To be fair, the loss didn't necessarily hurt Brock Lesnar nor his bank account, but seeing Cena win again when the odds were stacked so highly against him probably did John more harm than good. Dude. It didn't, bro. I, at that time, no. That should have been the catalyst, truly, to see the spiral of John Cena. He lost to The Rock. Now he losing to Brock Lesnar the next fucking month, <laughs> the next pay-per-view. And he can't seem to get a win. That That's... That's how you build some type of character development. He can't get a win. You could have easily turned him heel. We know Vince didn't want to, but it was just like, missed. Did Brock need to win? Not really, but it would have, it would have did more service for John to lose here, and to really solidify that John is. He's going through something right now. <laughs> it kind of made fans grumble a bit because, like it or not, Brock did bring something new to WWE when he returned, and that was an incredibly vicious and violent ring style that no one in the company had shown before. <laughs> the damn rip. <laughs> This is one that gets brought up all the time, yet it's one I don't agree with. People have commented about this outcome too in my Reliving the War series, but I'll explain why I don't agree with it in a moment. Diamond Dallas Page got himself a title shot against the undefeated Bill Goldberg at Halloween Havoc 1998, and everyone felt that DDP should have won. Loads of folks who bought the pay-per-view didn't see the match ending because Halloween Havoc ran for too long, but it aired for free the following night on Nitro, and the two had a very good match that folks say had the wrong idea come. In my opinion, and it's only my opinion, DDP should have won the world belt, but he shouldn't have beaten Goldberg for it. Page was adored by WCW fans during this time period, and I think when he eventually won the title at Spring Stampede the following year, it was definitely too little too late. But then you have to look at Goldberg and see the fans' reaction to Goldberg. Page was popular for sure, but Goldberg's popularity was truly on another level, yeah. and I personally think that fans could have potentially turned on page if he ended the streak on this night. You really need to look back at how fans treated Goldberg back then. His mm -hmm. name was chanted in matches he wasn't even involved in. Yep. Arenas exploded the second he stepped into the ring. And, you know, without question, DDP was the better wrestler, but Goldberg was the safest choice WCW had when deciding the outcome for this match. Mm -hmm. If it had been anyone else other than Goldberg, then I'd say absolutely DDP should have won. And I do think DDP should have won the championship in 1998. But as good as DDP DDP versus Goldberg was, I probably wouldn't have booked that match in the first place. Mm. Makes sense. Charlotte defeated Asuka at WrestleMania 34, and there was really no upside. Yeah. Just talked about this. Jesus Christ. The Charlotte retaining her championship here. Asuka was undefeated in WWE during her whole run in NXT. She didn't take a single loss, and this win streak continued when Asuka made it to the main roster. Riding a huge wave of popularity and being seen as the most unstoppable female competitor the WWE had at the time, she won the Royal Rumble and earned the right to face Charlotte at the biggest event of the year. And Charlotte beat her clean as a whistle at WrestleMania. Not only made that, Charlotte tap. made Asuka top out to reclaim the SmackDown Women's Championship. Two ways of looking at this, really. There's an argument to be made that Asuka winning the championship kind of repeats what happened to Goldberg. The company book themselves in a corner and they risk fan backlash when Asuka eventually loses the championship. But at the same time, it did feel like a major letdown when Charlotte ended this win streak at WrestleMania. Everyone thought the Empress of Tomorrow was going to win this one, yes. and I too would have bet money that she was going to leave Mania with the gold. But it didn't happen, and many fans see this as a big misstep by WWE. 
super misstep. What are we talking about, bro? Oscar could have benefited more from winning that. And then whoever beats her, that would have been a, a monumental moment for them. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying, man. And she would at least have one WrestleMania win on her record. Because right now, she has zero. Randy Orton versus Hulk Hogan, SummerSlam 2006. The young guy known as the Legend Killer was mm. unable to defeat possibly the biggest legend of them all, and I always thought the wrong call was made here. This would actually turn out to be Hogan's final WWE match, and it could have ended with Randy living up to his Legend Killer yes. moniker by ending Hulkamania for good. But yes. Hulk ended up beating Randy at around the 10 minute mark, and it was Orton who was showing up on TV for the remainder of the year while Hulk Hogan went home. I get it too, absolutely not hating on Hogan here because the brother was a master at this kind of thing, but there was way, way more upside to Randy defeating Hogan here Bats. simply because Randy had a lot more years ahead of him. The legend of Hulk Hogan will indeed be immortal whether Hulk wins or loses a pay-per-view match in 2006, so I just don't understand why the company wouldn't tell Hogan he was gonna lose and reap the benefits of their full-time guy now being the ultimate legend killer. To put it into perspective though, and to reel it in a bit here, the loss didn't really hurt Randy Orton in the long run. He achieved great things after the Hogan match, mm -hmm. and it's really just a distant memory now in terms of Randy's overall career. But the gloating this man could have done after ending Hulkamania yes. could have been some good TV. And that's the thing. I, I do. <laughs> there was definitely some uh, politicking, brother. <laughs> but Randy should have won. That's his gimmick. Hulk is leaving. Have Randy be the legend killer. I killed one of the best legends of all time. Hulkamania. Hulk Hogan. And have him run with that. Have him run with that. Give him more heel heat. It would have worked. I mean, it still worked out for him in the end. But I'm saying that would have rose his stock even more. And I don't think anyone would have tripped. But we know we ended up tripping in the end. So... I could name more Hogan matches here and I'm sure you could too, yeah. but I'll mention just one more. Hogan vs Yokozuna at WrestleMania 9, a match that I feel shouldn't have even taken place. Yeah. You know the story, Yokozuna wins his first WWF title after defeating Bret Hart. Hulk Hogan then comes down, he gets challenged to step into the ring against the new champ. Bret says, yay Hulkamania, go get him. And Hogan ends up beating Yokozuna in a matter of seconds. Hulkamaniacs rejoiced, but Hitman fans were less enamored. It also kinda sucked that Yokozuna had his big crowning moment also taken away from him, and yeah. I do feel we focus on Brett's side of the story without even considering how big Yoko felt about this whole thing. But yeah, an incredible lack of foresight here, even if it did pop the audience in Las Vegas. Yeah. Yokozuna would reclaim his championship at the 1993 King of the Ring, and Hogan would say goodbye to the WWF. Bret Hart, meanwhile, would get his big Mania moment when he defeated Yokozuna in a rematch the following year at Mania 10, so it kind of worked itself out in the end. Yeah, but still at the time. Awful. <laughs> Brock Lesnar ending The Undertaker's undefeated WrestleMania streak. Yes, this shouldn't have happened. I, don't, I, I know it's a, a moment that will stand the test of time, but it should not have happened. Not with him. Brock didn't need it. I get why they did it, but Brock didn't need this to to be the future champion again. He didn't. I would have loved if it was anybody to do it. It's either Bray or it should have been Roman. Me leaning more towards the Roman side of things only because Roman could have benefited from it so much more if it if the streak was completely still intact, instead of the Undertaker already having a loss, if the streak was really intact and Roman had faced him and Roman had beat the streak, you have a ultimate heel. The ultimate made man right there. But I didn't need it. That's all I'm saying.
I think wasn't the right call. I don't think Brock Lesnar was the right choice. Ending The Undertaker's undefeated streak at one point felt as equally as important as winning the WWE title at the showcase of the Immortals. There we in storyline, superstars would be desperate to have their chance against the dead man, and ending the streak became this impossible monumental task that folks would try to do each and every year. Brock Lesnar was the one who ended that streak at Mania 30, and I don't think he needed that accolade at all. When asked about this on the Broken Skull sessions, Vince McMahon kinda made it out like no one else on the roster had the credentials to end the streak other than Brock. Brock was the only believable option, apparently. But I think another really viable option would have been for the streak to never end. Just let The Undertaker retire with that incredible run of WrestleMania. Or you could have did that too. I see a lot of people saying, just have don't have the streak ever end. You could have did that too. I don't think anyone would have tripped. He could have retired being the only guy ever in WWE history. I think it probably would have stood a test of time to go undefeated at WrestleMania. No one beats him. You could have did that too. There's two things you could have did. Gave it to a talent that you know would benefit from it extremely well or don't have him lose it all victories and I don't know, even have someone try to match the win number years later or something. If the streak really had to end, then I would have went with either Randy Orton at WrestleMania 21 or Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 25 or 26. I just don't think Brock needed to end it, and if I had the choice, I would have let the Phenom retire with that great win streak still intact. It would have been a way to further immortalize one of yeah. the greatest legends to ever step foot in a WWE ring. Completely understand. Another WrestleMania match, Triple H versus Sting at WrestleMania 31. Again, like many of these matches, it all comes down to the winner not really needing the victory, and Triple H did not need to beat Sting at WrestleMania. The WWE could have proved here that they weren't all about killing off former WCW stars, Facts. and they could have gave Sting a bit more reassurance in his new job by letting him win on the platform he wanted to perform on for years, but no. Triple H wins this match that devolved into a DX versus NWO brawl. I do think Triple H's reign of terror thing gets overblown a little and I've always thought that particular run made the eventual downfall of Triple H a bit more exciting for fans to watch. You don't build up a super heel champion by having him lose, you know? But I also understand that the selections that were made for Hunter's opponents weren't right at all and the collateral damage that was done to guys like Booker and RVD could have been avoided. But at the same time, the reign of terror was all the way back at the beginning of the Ruthless Aggression era. Over 10 years later, in 2015, Triple H had absolutely nothing to prove anymore, yeah. and Sting having a match at WrestleMania was a real attraction. Why Sting couldn't just win this match is beyond me, and no matter what way you look at it, it seems like the decision to have Triple H go over was a petty one. It didn't do Triple H any favours, it didn't do Sting any favours, and fans look back at the match today with a little contempt. Of course, of course, of course. Still, it was cool to see what he did in AEW as well, but... Come on now, bro. Uh, they dropped the ball with that. The Fiend was one of the more interesting characters WWE presented during a time when things were pretty bleak within the company. Uh -huh. It was certainly one of the Recipe's more creative break. aspects of WWE programming during this time period, but what's even more important here is the fact that fans really got a kick out of Bray Wyatt's new alter ego. The Fiend defeated Seth Rollins at Crown Jewel 2019 for the Universal Championship and the decision to put the championship on The Fiend was a pretty positive one. There were many ways this championship run could go and whoever defeated this mysterious and sinister entity would likely have to overcome some insurmountable odds to become Universal Champion. Enter Bill Goldberg, a man who had wrestled two matches in 2019 and a man who would wrestle two matches in 2020. One of those matches was against The Fiend at Super Showdown and in this match Goldberg won the Universal Championship. Fans were pretty much outraged at this outcome and I'll admit I thought it was pretty dumb too and I don't dislike Bill Goldberg the way everyone else does. Again, it goes back to having no upside. Goldberg's other 2020 match was against Braun Strowman at WrestleMania 36 mere weeks after Super Showdown and to add insult to injury, Goldberg dropped the championship in this very match. So the Fiend's run with the championship was destroyed for the sake of a Goldberg run that didn't even last for a month.
The fact that Goldberg would only show up every now and then on TV didn't really help matters. His WWE history from 2016 onwards was nothing more but a match here and a match there, and the vast majority of fans felt that Goldberg shouldn't have been in the title picture at all seeing as he was only appearing on a part time basis. The fact that he beat The Fiend, one of the WWE's brighter prospects in a very long time, in a match that went for 3 minutes only amplified the problem. I don't even have to say anything. Y'all know how I feel about this particular travesty. I don't have to say anything. I've already made plenty of sound bites about this particular situation. Just all you can do is shake your head when you're reminded of it. The 7-on-7 seven seven elimination match yeah. at SummerSlam 2010 was a bit of a joke <laughs> and it's used a lot when people talk about the Super Cena years. That period of time when it was just accepted by fans that John Cena's gonna win even when it made no sense for him to do so. It was a Team WWE vs Team Nexus elimination match and the Nexus were white hot. According to Wade Barrett, the Nexus thought they were winning the match but the decision was changed very late. And many viewers felt that the Nexus really should have won this bout because it would have further solidified them as a real force in WWE. Now, to be fair too, the Nexus story was all about strength and numbers. When those numbers dwindled down or when some of the lads have to have matches on their own with no interference, they wouldn't usually fare too well. So as Team Nexus got smaller and smaller as the match progressed, it kinda made sense that they would look and feel a lot weaker. But the way John Cena won this match has been criticised quite a lot and we would learn years later that the one big spot that gets called out all the time was actually Cena's idea. Uh -huh. John took a DDT on the concrete floor and was still able to win the match. <laughs> it's not like other folks haven't been planted with a DDT on the outside only to continue on wrestling afterwards, but the way it was done made the DDT look like a legit career ending move and the Nexus had a 2 on 1 advantage here to boot. The odds were just way too highly stacked against Cena, yet about a minute after taking that DDT he was able to eliminate both Justin Gabriel and Wade Barrett to win the match. Chris Jericho and Edge, members of Team WWE on this night, criticised the DDT on Jericho's podcast. They said it was a John Cena idea and John actually said afterwards that he should have listened to Jericho and Edge telling him the spot wasn't going to go over well. But on top of this, I think the Nexus should have won on this night and it's a shame the decision to let Team WWE win was changed at the very last minute. I don't think any single member of the Nexus were at the level John Cena was at at SummerSlam 2010, not by a long shot, but that strength in numbers thing could have came into play once again and the faction could have came out stronger than ever following this oh, pay-per-view without causing any damage to John Cena's reputation afterwards. As a matter of fact, it could have probably helped John Cena's reputation quite a bit. <laughs> Sneaker took a DDT to the exposed concrete only to get up later within a minute in a 2v1 situation. He should have died. <laughs> it should have been over. It's over. <laughs> it's fucking Oh Batista God. winning his second Royal Rumble in 2014 oh, was seen yeah. as a big mistake and even Batista himself said he shouldn't have won the Rumble that year. This happened in the middle of the whole Yes Movement thing where fans were clamouring for Daniel Bryan to get a break and the fans were desperate to see Daniel get another opportunity at the big time. The thing is though, Daniel wasn't even part of the match, so I really don't think it mattered who won this Royal Rumble. The audience were going to react negatively no yeah. matter what. That being said too, Batista had only returned and it looked like his run wasn't going to be that long. Big Dave was a Hollywood star when he came back to WWE and generally speaking, pro wrestling fans can sometimes see part timers as vultures swooping mm -hmm. in and claiming the spotlight, taking away those big moments that really belong to someone else. Even Rey Mysterio got booed in this match just for coming out at number 30. Fans were hoping and praying that Daniel would be the final entrant even though he wasn't advertised for the match. And if Daniel's absence made fans boo Rey Mysterio then that should tell you all you need to know about Daniel's popularity during this time period. Yep. With this in mind, I always thought the Bray Wyatt vs Daniel Bryan match that happened earlier in the night was fantastic and it's one of my favourite Daniel Bryan matches ever. Facts. I know it's not really a consolation for fans in attendance that night, but at least they still got to see a good oh, matchup featuring their- That shit was such a good match. Now, in my opinion, it, that's probably the match I remember the most from that, 
that yes movement era obviously you know what happened at wrestlemania 30 was fantastic too you know but that was really one of those really standalone great matches a great feud with bray and daniel Bryan at the time just chef's kiss and that night could have been even more memorable if daniel Bryan lost that but he enters in the royal rumble and he won it after overcoming bray he won it. Oh my! The crowd would have lost. Yeah. Yeah, you know, but it worked out in the end. That's all that matters. He won it at WrestleMania 30. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Their hero. In the end, Daniel Bryan didn't lose any popularity. He actually gained popularity from this little misstep, but it certainly affected Batista's standing in the company. Another Goldberg one right here, but this time it's Goldberg who should have won, in yeah. my opinion. Since he arrived in WWE in 2003, Goldberg struggled a little when getting over with the fans. He definitely had his supporters, but he would also get booed if he went up against the wrong person. Just look at his first WWE match against The Rock and you'll know what I'm talking about. That being said, fan opinion began to shift a little by the time SummerSlam 2003 arrived, and as it would turn out, Goldberg was favoured to win the World Championship Elimination yeah. Chamber match that was going to headline that particular show. It seemed like WWE had finally tapped into what made Goldberg so popular in WCW as he went to work inside the chamber. Goldberg put on a really dominant performance here so as he fun. eliminated Randy Orton, Shawn Michaels and Chris Jericho all within around 3 minutes. But what you really need to keep in mind here is the fact that fans were going crazy for <laughs> Goldberg while this was going down. Yeah. Everyone was happy to see Goldberg wreck everything that moved inside that chamber and it felt like the roof was going to come off the arena when he won the championship. Only he <laughs> didn't win the championship. He was put down by Triple H's sledgehammer and he got pinned by the game at the end of the match. Worse still, Goldberg was beaten up by Triple H in Evolution as the event faded out, meaning the aforementioned reign of terror was going to continue. Now Goldberg did win the championship the following month at Unforgiven and he beat Triple H in a career versus title match, but in a way the WWE let the moment pass and the Elimination Chamber result would end up hurting both Goldberg and Triple H when it came to their overall- I'm not gonna lie to you, that shit was fucking cool. He fucking wrecked shopping eliminates. When he kicked open that plexiglass, I was like, oh, oh, this shit was great. <laughs> he kicked that shit and punched that shit down. And Triple H is just like, oh, this shit was so, I was like, you got to put the title on him. Did they? No, they waited fucking at the next show. Like, what was the point, bro? Come on perception in the eyes of wrestling fans. It's another cheap win for Triple H and it's Goldberg at his most dominant still getting his ass kicked. More of a personal choice but hear me out, Shawn Michaels should have defeated Diesel at WrestleMania 11 for the mm. WWF title. Not only did the crowd begin to turn on Diesel more and more as the match progressed, but Diesel winning this match did two major things that hurt the company overall in my opinion. Firstly, it led to Diesel having a string of mediocre main event title matches until he lost the belt to Bret Hart at Survivor Series 95, and two, the win effectively took Shawn Michaels off the road for around 6 weeks while the company repackaged him as a babyface. In 1995, the company could simply not afford to take their top talent away from TV screens. 1995 could have looked a lot different with Shawn Michaels headlining shows as a heel champion. You could argue that the butterfly effect would have been way too drastic with the Mania mm. 12 match and 1996 babyface run possibly not happening, but mm. 1995 was such a bad year for WWF that I actually think it would have been interesting to see how someone else would have fared as the main headline act. Ratings may not have increased, but it's certain that match quality would have. The run could even end at SummerSlam, which could have potentially gave HBK a chance to turn babyface just in time for the Royal Rumble, but really it's all hypothetical anyway, and yeah. it's more of a personal choice that's just more of a curiosity than anything deeply substantial. Just something to think about really. Yep, crazy how things play As out. As always, I've left out loads here. Hey, this was a great one, man. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, give the homie a like here, bro. Because he's always putting out some pretty dope uh, videos, especially when it comes to, you know, going down memory lane. So this was definitely dope. Uh, once again, go check out Wrestling Bios. Got, he has some um, great wrestling related content. Go show him some love. I'm going to link the original video down below. So that way you guys can go check it out and subscribe to him if you haven't already. But yeah, there's plenty more that you could easily say should have won 
um, their respective matches, but Vince McMahon and management didn't see it that way. Or there was probably some politicking involved to kind of de-push someone or, you know, someone say, hey, hey, Vince, I know you want this guy to win, but I don't know if he's ready to win. You know, things like that happen. So, but comment down below. Let me know some other scenarios or matches or matchups where you felt like the person should have won the match, but they didn't. Let me know down below if it wasn't listed in this video already. But I appreciate all the love and support. Road to 150K, and I'm still young. Speed the YouTube wrestling champ of the world. Appreciate y'all keeping me. See you on the next one. Peace.